Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien 2. Today, reviewing this Hanway Rhinelander. Right up front, I should say that I did not buy this sword. It was sent to me by the shop Sword Is as a review sample in which I did like an unboxing video and first impressions. They sent me two different swords. I did do an unboxing video. I will link it in the description. Now, at Sword Is, this sword retails for $280. You can find this sword all over the place though. This is one of Hanway's most prolific models. I found it on Amazon, on Cult of Athena, Sword Is, the SPG store, Chicago Knife Works, Museum Replicas Limited, Therian Arms. The point being, there's a lot of places that offer this sword and the prices vary throughout to those. So if you are interested in buying a Rhinelander, I recommend you shop around and find the store that has the best price and combination of customer service and shipping that works best for you. Whatever you go with though, this sword is generally speaking around 250 to 275. That's the general price range that I'm going to consider for this sword, which puts it solidly in the budget category for medieval European swords. The scabbard that comes with this sword is pretty bare bones. It does have a uh, metal collar here and a chape as well. It's a simple uh, leather wrap on here with a stitched seam. The stitching is very small. The fit is quite snug. There's a little bit of rattle if I do it like this. Pretty much none if I do it like this. I, if I hold it upside down, shake it, it's not going anywhere. And I do have to give it a little bit of a tug to get it out. And if I swap it around, it's a little bit looser this way, but very, very minor. So overall, it's a pretty good fit. The thing about this scabbard that's kind of interesting is it's not wood core. I'm not sure what material makes up the core. It's some kind of modern material, though. I don't know what it is. It might be fiberglass, something like that, but it's definitely not a wood core scabbard. Overall, I like the overall look of the scabbard and it is a functional one. I've stored, I, I've, I've had several swords from Hanway that have this type of scabbard. I've stored the swords in them for months at a time, never had any rust. So whatever material they put as the core of these types of swords, it works as a protector. And overall, it's a good addition to the sword because it's functional and it, it keep, protects you from the sword and the sword from the elements. Starting with the hilt, let's take a look at the pommel. This would be a type T5 pommel, which is in the scent stopper family. This one has a little bit of a modern look to it. Uh, it's got this kind of tumbled finish to it that a lot of Hanway medieval swords have, and it makes it look a little modern and combined with the overall shape, makes the pommel look a little bit like a door handle or doorknob. It's not egregious or anything like that. And this is overall a relatively historic shape, but it, due to that finish, it does make it look like that. I believe this is this finish and it helps prevent corrosion. And I think it's also, this might actually be stainless steel. I'm not positive on that. But what I've noticed on Hanway medieval swords is when they have this type of finish, they definitely seem to be much more resistant to corrosion. Due to the overall shape, there's absolutely no corners anywhere on this pommel, so it is incredibly comfortable to hold. It works very well to stop your hand sliding back. And overall, it's a very effective shape and fits with the later medieval, early Renaissance aesthetic of having a ring guard, which we'll get to in a minute. The peen here is very obviously hand done. There's a lot of hammer marks, both in the pommel and on the peen. And whether or not that bothers you is up to you. It doesn't really bother me. It shows some hand finishing here. And basically at the price point this sword is at, you can't expect perfect fit and finish. And if I'm going to see less than perfect fit and finish, I think it makes sense to see it at the peen where 
most people won't ever, won't ever even look at the sword. The grip is very similar to the scabbard, actually, in that I don't believe the core of it is actually wood. I think it's a modern material. This is something that Hanwei does on several of their European medieval inspired swords. It's an effective grip. It's designed well in that it's wider than it is thick, and it has pretty much no taper in this upper half, and then it tapers in into a kind of a wasted grip towards the pommel. Overall, the transitions here to the pommel, very good, no hot spots there. There's a riser right here in the middle. It's not particularly well-defined. It definitely could be more well-defined, but it is an effective grip. I can white knuckle the grip, as Matthew Jensen says, and try to twist the sword in my hand. It's not moving anywhere, so it's an effective grip. I don't really particularly like the texture of the leather used here. It's a little bit squishy and a little bit tacky, especially if once the hands start getting sweaty, the, the leather starts feeling a little tacky, a little sticky. And like I said, it, the leather and the entire grip feels just a little bit squishy. I would prefer it to feel more solid in my hand. And I would also like to have that uh, cord wrap texture that you'll oftentimes see. It's not a requirement, but it's common and I like the way both it looks and feels. But this is still an effective grip and that's really the most important part of a grip. The cross guard on here is a type 13. I like the look. It's not particularly my favorite, especially the bulbs there. They don't really do a whole lot for me, but I know some people really appreciate them. I like the look, I just like other looks better. It of course also has the addition of a ring guard on it on one side of the blade only. That means that there is definitively a true edge and a false edge for the sword. I'll get into that more during cutting, handling, all, you know, the blade, all that stuff. But because there is a ring guard here on one side, that's going to protect your upper hand. So if you're holding it with your upper hand, it's going to go like that. If you're holding it with your left hand, it's going to go like that. That's just what the ring guard is designed for. It's not designed to protect the thumb because if you put your thumb through it, it doesn't do any good if the uh, opposing sword slides down the blade. And you also have to be careful. If you really choke up here like this, you could actually end up sticking your fingers out past that ring guard. The blade cut slides down and hits right into your fingers. It won't go deep because the ring guard will stop it, but it'll still give you a pretty nasty cut. So you really want to make sure you grip this properly to take full use of that ring guard. Now the finish on the guard is just like the pommel. It's got that tumbled look to it that says modern, but it's a, again, an effective look that is consistent with a lot of Hanwei swords. If we look at the gap, where the blade meets the guard, it's actually quite well done. Not very much of a gap at all, very nicely seated in there. I have seen a little bit of white in that gap, which implies epoxy, but I don't think it's actually a problem because the sword actually rings very nicely when the blade is flicked, which usually means solid hilt construction. If you have a sword with a ton of epoxy filling up the grip, that tends to dull that ringing sound. So the fact that that doesn't happen here, that's a good sign. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this sword has pretty minimal profile taper throughout, although it does taper consistently and evenly until it gets to the ogive curve of the tip. It's relatively broad and stays relatively broad throughout. In addition, it starts at around six and a half millimeters thick, gets a little bit thinner pretty quick down to four and a half millimeters, and then pretty much stays that thickness until it hits the end of the fuller where this being a diamond cross section, it flares back out in thickness there. And then it, do it doesn't taper much beyond that until it gets down towards the last nine inches of the blade or so, where it does taper down to a little bit under four millimeters. It's a little bit of a not particularly great distal taper. It would work better, in my opinion, if it was more linear throughout and maybe got down a little bit thinner out towards the tip. It's not bad, but it could be refined some. 
Now, there is a, not what I would call a ricasso on this sword, but there is a good six inches where it is unsharpened. And that, that's definitely not a ricasso. That's just an unsharpened part of the sword. But there is, after that word is sharp, it is a, no secondary bevel. It is blended into the rest of the blade. The fuller is about half the length of the blade, which combined with the profile of the sword blade kind of makes this a weird one to classify because it doesn't really fit neatly into any of the oak shot typology. The overall profile reminds me of a type 12A sword, but the cross section is, it, that pretty much doesn't work for 12A. Neither does the side ring here. That was a development in medieval history much later than type 12A swords. In fact, it was more of a Renaissance thing, maybe late medieval. The fuller is a bit long for late medieval swords as well. It kind of fits into an 18A, but again, the fuller is a bit long and wide for that. It could, in some people's eyes, be considered a 16A. The fuller might be a little bit long for that, but the cross section is wrong. It's not hexagonal. It could be maybe like a type 19, something like that, but it doesn't really bear much of the uh, characteristics of that type of sword. So it's kind of an amalgamation of variety of types without being anything particular, it, which makes it end up looking like a modern sword rather than something that is replicating a sword from history. And adding to that is the finish on here. And that finish is very typical of several different models of Hanway's European medieval swords, like the Hanway Tinker line. It has this very, I don't know quite how to describe it. You can see the grind lines very visibly. It's not polished particularly, but it has a very unique look. Hopefully you can see that in these photos and videos. And like I said, it's a, what makes it look like a modern finish. I don't dislike it, but it is something to keep in mind because like I said, it does have something of a modern look to it. On the other side of the blade, there is one little mark on here, right here, that is a horse. And that's something that's clearly inspired by European medieval history. A lot of swords did have little marks in the blades in different places. If we look down the lengths of the blade and look for rippling, we see a lot of it. It is very consistent, very even, and very minor. They're rippling the entire length, but it is not even really visible or tactile. I can't really feel the rippling, so it's very, very shallow. It's much more a rippling in the finish than in the geometry of the blade. So it's not really anything to worry about. It's just something, if you notice it, the rippling looks, again, modern. It definitely has a modern look to it. And like I said, the sword does come sharp and there's no secondary bevel. It's not been sharpened after being made a blunt. It is designed to be sharp out of the box. All right, I'm going to test the edge on some paper. I'll start with, if you're holding the sword in your right hand, what is the true edge? It pretty much completely failed to stop, to start the cut there. And again there. So it's got a little bit of a burr there, right? Pretty much down throughout the entire sword from what I've noticed. And that kind of makes it hard to start a cut. Yeah. But if we put it, insert the sword in, yeah. It's a pretty rough and jagged cut that had some tearing in there and also some starts and stops. So the edge, it, while it is sharp, this edge at least, it's not paper cutting sharp out of the box. And now testing the, what would be the false edge if I were holding it right-handed or the true edge if I were holding it left-handed. So that one did start a cut there. It's, it failed to start a cut, then it started it, and then it kind of stopped as it hit a duller spot. Let's try that again. So this edge might have a tiny bit more sharpness, but it's definitely not particularly consistent because it's starting and stopping quite a bit. Yeah, as, as I was drawing it through there, it did stop at one point. As I was drawing it through there, it was definitely 
slicing the paper a bit easier than the other edge. So that edge is a little bit sharper. I wouldn't really call it paper cutting sharp though. Moving on to cutting. Now you're going to hear this a lot for me in the next few months. I did not do very much cutting with this sword. It is just too hot to be able for, for me to be able to do much cutting. I'm sitting here at one in the afternoon. It is 116 degrees Fahrenheit outside. When I got up and got breakfast this morning at about 6.20, it was already over 90 degrees. So it's just not something I can do very much at all. I did one session with some water bottles and the sword cuts okay. It's not great, it's not terrible, but it, it, it's okay. It handles well enough to cut. The edge is sharp enough to cut, but not sharp enough to really do me any favors. The blade is pretty rigid due to the fact that it doesn't have a ton of distal taper and that rigidity can help it power through light targets. It's perfectly competent as a backyard cutter and with a better edge it would probably do a lot better and it has the geometry to be able to do pretty decent at cutting something like tatami although i did not cut tatami it could use to be a little bit thinner out here i think that would help its cutting performance but it's not bad it's just not great <laughs> All right, let's talk about handling of the Rhinelander. Now, it, this sword weighs three pounds, three ounces, and it's balanced, oh, that looks like about four inches, four and a half inches from the guard. So that's going to be a pretty good balance between cut and thrust by just that basic feel of a balanced point of balance, if you will. That, that kind of is, doesn't make full sense, but. It's balanced between a cut focus sword where the point of balance tends to be further out and with a thrust focus sword where the point of balance tends to be closer to the guard. This sword de has definite blade presence. I feel the blade out there, but it doesn't feel tip heavy and it doesn't feel like it's the sword is dragging me through the cut. If I, I can stop it right where I want it to without a lot of strain on the wrists, on the arms, on the shoulders, on anything. It's a pretty nimble sword. It could be nimbler, of course, because it is balanced at where I said it is, but it, I, I feel like that's a good overall balance between cut and thrust. If I ho just hold it out here, the sword doesn't, the tip doesn't really wobble much at all. That's because this is a pretty rigid sword. You can see it doesn't have a ton of flex when I just bonk the pommel like that. And if I go to flex it, it doesn't flex very much at all. A little bit, but not a lot. That's because this is a relatively thick blade. It does have some distal taper, but it doesn't have a ton. So when you get out here, there's still a decent amount of thickness out this way that helps it maintain rigidity. That's going to help it in the thrust, but also in the cut because having a rigid sword helps you power through cuts a lot easier and it is more forgiving of poor edge alignment. All right, I'm going to compare the Rhinelander to two other swords in these, this general price range. The first one would be the Hanwei Albrecht II hand and a half sword. I've seen this sword called a few different Things. This is another classic of Hanwei's line. If you look at them, you can see they are fairly similar blades, fairly similar hilts. The Rhinelander definitely stays wider than the Albrecht, but overall, relatively similar blades. Now, the Rhinelander weighs three pounds, three ounces. The Albrecht, three pounds, five ounces. So when I pick up the Albrecht, there's two things that I immediately notice. One, the grip is a considerably smaller, but this also feels more like a hand and a half sword. I feel like I can pull it, put it out there easier one-handed than I could the Rhinelander. At the same time though, I feel like there might be a little bit more weight here and here. So on both ends of the sword, as opposed to the Rhinelander, which is kind of interesting. I mean, you look at that pommel, that's a honking pommel but it is also hollow. 
at least partially hollow. So that's not as much counterweight as you might think it is. But this is still one of my favorite budget um, long swords or hand and a half swords, bastard swords, whatever you want to classify it as. And moving this around, it feels nimbler immediately. I think a lot of that is the weight back here, but the weight here also means it helps it having extra weight on both on both ends helps it pivot easier. My hunch is that this is going to be balanced closer to the guard. A little bit. That looks like about four inches. The Rhinelander four and a half to five is my hunch. So not as much as I thought, but this sword immediately feels just a little bit quicker, a little bit more responsive. Part of that also might be that the blade is shorter and it, it's it's minor differences here. But I do notice this feels a little bit quicker, a little bit nimbler, definitely more usable one-handed. Again, I think actually the blade length is, go, is what's causing that. Yeah, so I pick up the Rhinelander again. More of the weight of the blade feels out like right around here as opposed to the tip. It feels like it's more in the uh, cutting portion of the blade, which makes it, give, gives it a little bit different blade presence, more blade presence, but not in the same way, like I said, this doesn't feel like it has quite as much agility to me because it doesn't have those pivoting points quite the same. All right, the other sword I'm going to compare to the Rhinelander is this Cold Steel Hand and a Half, another classic budget long sword. We look at these two, Cold Steel definitely has a much longer hilt. Looks like the Rhinelander might be a bit longer. Uh, they both stay approximately the same width throughout. The hand and a half, the cold steel hand and a half, this feels like a misnomer to me. With that long of a hilt, the blade presence here doesn't really feel like a hand and a half sword to me so much as a two-handed sword. But this one also weighs three pounds, five ounces, pretty much the exact same weight as the Albrecht. And it has a very different feel to it. And it's going to be hard to describe how that is. Part of it is the long hilt. Normally, I end up usually keeping my hands fairly close together. That feels weird with this sword. If I separate them, yeah, that starts feeling more like it wants to pivot where I want it to go. Whereas if I do like this, this feels awkward as hell. So I don't like the way that feels in the hand. This sword, yeah, I don't like the way it feels one-handed either. But the, this sword also, like the Rhinelander, feels like it has more weight right in the cutting portion, maybe not quite as much, relatively speaking, at the point. I think a large part of that is the longer hilt bringing the entire balance, the, the, point, the pivot point back some, because the point of balance here is definitely closer to the guard. That looks like about two and a half, three inches, three and a half, somewhere around there. This is a very different feeling sword, that is for sure. It has more... Pretty much as easy to stop as the Rhinelander. God, I'm, I'm really struggling to explain how different this feels. So much of it is due to the hilt. Having this large of a hilt just changes the way the sword moves around so much. And its balance, its it pivots in a very different way. And I wish I could explain better than that. All I can really say is these two swords really don't feel much of anything alike. I will say the Rhinelander feels more akin to other swords that I have handled, more akin to swords that might be a closer to historically inspired, such as Albion's and the like. It feels more like those than the Cold Steel does. This feels to the way I interpret how swords handle. This feels more like a modern sword. Than the, than the Rhinelander and those other swords do. So overall, I do like the way this sword handles. I think I like the way the Albrecht handles a little bit more, but not much at all. This is a very nice feeling sword, it handles well. I like the rigidity of it. It feels like a good balance between cut and thrust. I can put the point pretty much where I want to, and I like the way it handles. It is 
at least somewhat analogous to how higher end swords handle, which is a good thing to get out of a budget sword. Bottom line, this sword costs in the $250, $270 price range. Is it worth that price? Well, first I'm going to do some very quick potential improvements rather than putting it into its own section. I'm just gonna do them now. A little bit better distal taper implementation would greatly improve the handling of the sword. Getting a different leather on the grip, one that feels better, I would absolutely love to see that. And the sharpness could be a little bit uh, sharper. But for 250, 275, somewhere around there, this is a very compelling offer. You get a sword that is, I would call, historically plausible, with a bit of an asterisk there. You get a scabbard that is functional. You get a sword that is sharp out of the box, that is a decent cutter that doesn't have a secondary bevel, and has a pretty unique look. You don't find very many reprotection swords on the market with a side ring, even though they did show up on uh, period swords. Not a crazy amount, but they were definitely there. So you get a sword that is a decent sword at a good price. And that to me means, yeah, it is worth it. I'm never going to say this is my favorite sword. There's just no way. I like some of the other swords in the budget range that more than that, like the Albrecht that I compared it to, I definitely like that sword more. I think it handles better. I think it cuts a little bit better and I just like the look of it overall better. But that's not to say I dislike any of those here. It's just not quite as good as the Albrecht. And the Albrecht to me is one of the best budget swords on the market. So that's comparing it against a pretty high bar. But overall, yes, I do think this sword is worth the rough price range. Like I said, I would definitely shop around, find where you can get it at uh, the best price. And this sword sometimes does go on sale at, some, at points too. So you could probably even find it less than 250 if you're diligent about looking and keeping an eye and watching prices. So yeah, I do think this is worth it. And I think it's actually a really good option for somebody who is trying to find their first long sword. This will handle like a long sword it looks like a long sword, it cuts like one, and it's a good option for a budget sword. And really, what else can you ask for at this price point? And that's going to wrap up this review. I want to give a thank you to Swordiz for sending me this sword, as well as the other one that I'll be reviewing in about a month. Like I said earlier to my viewers, check out Swordiz. You know, they may not have the best prices all the time, but sometimes their prices are very good, and it's always good to have extra stores around. Competition is good. So check them out. Look at what they have. They do have some pretty unique stuff. And keep an eye on them. Maybe they'll have the sword you want at the best price. But until next time, Alien 2 out.